so um, <clears throat> um, the first question will always be, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, let's see, I am a class of 1991 and I married uh, someone from Earlham. My husband went to Earlham and I am uh, on the Alumni Earlham Council Network, sort of. Um, and I have worked primarily in public policy and then I moved to working um, in this area of empathy in times of suffering. And so I wrote a book on that topic and do workshops and am now uh, starting to build a company on that theme. Wow. So two very somewhat different careers, but there's a lot of uh, interweaving across the two. Yeah. When I was reading about your profile, I, I realized that did you, I mean, you actually um, change your career a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So could you like go into more details about like what happened and why did you decide to to make that career shift? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, when working, so I got my PhD at Berkeley and when working on my dissertation about local politics of grant making, which was the career I went into after leaving that program, I was on the side doing this research on how to support others in a difficult time. And I thought it would just be this little side project that I would do for my yeah. own benefit and for the world, having no idea how hard it was to get a book published. I <laughs> and I was really compelled by this mission to have that work out there. And yet also really drawn to my career in public policy. And so I was trying to do what I could on the margins, really trying to do two big jobs and okay. then I had my um my, a baby and Congrats. <laughs> then I was like really busy and then oh, okay. um I had some opportunities that allowed me to work more part-time and so I left my career job for that which was like consulting in, in oh, okay. businesses and stuff and then I got sick with cancer and all of these oh. nice things happened to me. And I was like, this is, I either have to go with, this is like a sign from the universe. I either have to go with this or let it go. You know, I can't keep trying to do like both at the same time. So then I made a choice to pursue this other work. Uh, but it was really very, I mean, both thankfully have been very rewarding in terms of mission and purpose. It's not like I left a career, you know, exploiting, you know, yeah. You know, black communities with environmental pollution with, you know, Chevron company, like <laughs> to do this, I was already doing good work and then went to do this other kind of good work. Yeah. Wow. That was a um, rough ride. <laughs> yeah. That was really um, challenging path for you. Um, yes. Yeah. So, um, but do you feel like um, the career that you are doing now, this, did Earlham prepare you for what you're doing right now? Oh, in so many ways I do. I think that Earlham, first of all, for many of us, it leads with a place of character and values. And I believe that uh, I have, you know, I started from a very, very humble background, uh, financially, economically, you know, networky wise. Uh, and the only thing that enabled me to elevate my work in public policy, where I built a lot of very important pol uh, partnerships, and then in this area of compassion, where I got, you know, endorsements from Sheryl Sandberg or author Elizabeth Gilbert or whatever. The only thing I think that's helped me network when I didn't have a network was my integrity to this work and my mm -hmm. belief in it and a sense of service and mission. And people respond to that um, and they trust that and will help yeah. you. So Earlham gave that to me. Uh, so then when I started my work in this compassion space and I did a fundraising campaign with Indiegogo, Earlham folks who I hadn't seen in 20 years were my biggest supporter base and spreading it, um, sharing it wide, 
you know, helped me raise $18,000 for my passion project. It was beautiful. They've networked my work since then, uh, given me venues to do my workshops. One Earlham person introduced me to my collaborator that helped my book, you know, launch in almost get on the New York Times because she had such a social media presence. Like wow. Earlham's been instrumental in my sense of um, work identity and accomplishments. Yeah. That is so um, great to hear about that. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I am glad that you, um, you got that um, support from Earlham. Yeah, you know, I think because it's such an isolated campus, um, you know, uh, I grew up in New York City and it's very, diff you know, kids can kind of diffuse all over the place and become a member of some dance club that has nothing to do with your campus or, you know, there's just a lot of diffusion. Whereas at Earlham, there's a lot of micro communities that form because it is, you yeah. know, and, and at the time you can kind of be like, oh my God, yeah, no one, they don't have good cheddar cheese here or whatever it is, you know, <laughs> or whatever you might yeah. be missing from home or something, you know, but like <laughs> at the same time, uh, it kind of helps you build your own connections. Mm. So, um, so you have a career transition from public policy mm -hmm. uh, for like 20 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now you're doing empathy education and publish a book about that. Mm -hmm. So, so do you have like, any advice for, um, uh, for, students, uh, especially early students, uh, who would like to change their career because um, I know a lot of people here at Orla, my friends and other students included, they, they think they want to do something different. Mm. So from like students, their chosen yes. major? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, what you choose as a major, you know, it's so funny because it will catch up to you, like why you chose that major, even if you wind up doing something really different. Okay. Um, there's always some through line. So, you know, I went from studying psychology to studying community organizing, public policy, working macro, um, feeling like, you know, I'd be so bored if I were a therapist. And now I'm drawing upon a lot of human relations theory that I did in my undergrad for my work. I still see it as community building because of the way that I approach my work, but you know, it, it rests on a lot of psychological theory. And um, so it's, it's so hard to know like where your various experiences are going to connect. And even in my work in public policy, a lot of those colleagues are now clients for this current work that I do. So um, yeah. for students who are concerned about wanting to do something different from what they studied in undergrad, feeling like, oh my God, I wasted all this money and all this time. And all these other yeah. people are ahead of me because they majored in, I don't know, biology and I did French okay. literature and now <laughs> what, you know? Uh, okay. That's it's me. really, really great to get, if you can afford it, and more places have integrity about bringing on interns that they can pay. Um, but you can find like small jobs, internship jobs, which is a hard thing to say right now in times of COVID, you know, where people are leaving school That's true. and not feeling sure what's ahead of them. Yeah. Uh, but if they're able to stay home and kind of have an excuse for it <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, using that time to get some kind of low paying, but nonetheless super interesting company or nonprofit in an area that could be very different from what they studied at that young age, people want to, for example, if you're interviewing and you were a French lit major and now you want to look into biology, Say, yeah. you know, I read these three books in cell biology that just came out, some kind of mainstream books, and I'm yeah. hooked. Like, they just want to know that you're passionate about it. And actually, that's, that's more attractive in hiring people, that they really care about their subject, than that they studied it under, you know, 
the threat of a gun from their because their parent wanted them <laughs> to study biology. Um, so really trusting that if you want to explore other career options at your young age, you really can and just impress anybody you're interviewing with, even in a cover letter. I had somebody write a cover letter to me and he referenced three things uh, that he'd read that I'd also read that were important to me that he read that, that were important to him and really stood out because of that. So that's what I would recommend um, to illustrate why to somebody who might employ you, take you on and as an intern is to illustrate your passion. That's great advice. So um, um, I, so I wonder like what's your typical work day is like? Uh, I mean like not now because like we all know all this is going on, but like what's the typical day at work that you you are doing right now can you yeah. tell us about that yeah you know it's a little embarrassing because it's not that atypical <laughs> like <Okay>. even with <laughs> it's COVID, not typical. Like, not much has changed for okay. me um and because uh, i work from home uh, i have an office uh but i often work from home uh what's different okay. is my husband uh and child now hear me um and uh, let's see, days are very different. If, for example, right now before me in this month, I'm doing interviews with people in the education sector to talk about uh, what empathy looks like in the, in the school environment, and yeah. then coming up with catchy frameworks for conveying that information and partnering with people to create it into online con learning content. Um, okay. So every month is different and every day is very different, um, but it always is some mix of learning because I interview people to get a sense of mm -hmm. what matters and yeah. partnering because I'm not an expert in much at all. And uh, cleaning my house yeah <laughs> oh okay that's great yeah how great it is to like okay to have a um, job like that yeah well um, you know house cleaning is nobody really likes that one but yeah, <laughs> have to do it. yeah I can't relate <laughs> um, so sounds like that um, there's not a typical path in your career but if someone wants to be in a job um, like you, then what would you suggest that they do next? I can talk from two vantage points. Like if you okay. wanna have a career in public policy, sure. uh, I really recommend programs like the Coros Fellow Program. I would look up like fellows plus, and then women or young graduates or under okay. 30, but become a fellow and at a public policy entity. And there you do all your networking. It's building networks, it really is. And then getting a master's degree in either public policy or urban planning. Um, two okay. very, very useful degrees if people wanna work in government. And governments are really, you know, despite the way leadership is behaving right now, government's actually a really fun uh, sector to work in and it pays well. Um, okay. So there's that. And then if you wanna get into like, authoring a book and in training, that one's very different. It's, it requires a lot of entrepreneurial chutzpah, a lot of perseverance yeah. because you are often told no, you have to bounce back and return back to customers. You have to uh, think about sort of business angles, which I wasn't used to coming from Erlon, like how can I make money off of this? <laughs> yeah. It's a different mindset and yeah. um, it's a very valuable mindset. It helps motivate people to scale their work and to do more, but, um, uh, and getting to become an author in the self-development space, you really have to develop this whole social media platform yeah. um, that uh, I have not done, but that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. So uh -huh. I, I knew that you author a book, uh, and uh, I uh, help each other out. 
Mm, is that your mm -hmm. book? Oh. No, my book is called, uh, There's No Good Card for This. What to do and okay. say when life is scary, awful, and unfair to the people you love. And it's actually a really funny book. <laughs> okay. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, what that book is about? Oh, sure. Uh, let's see. That book, right here, oh, but it's probably book. backwards, um, yeah. is about, the title says it, it's if somebody's going through something really difficult. I don't know if you've had an experience, somebody's going through like a really awful breakup or a terrible loss of a parent or illness, or they've had to leave home and they weren't expecting to. Uh, they've had a lot of financial insecurity about uh, even feel bad if other kids are leaving home for campus and you're staying behind because your family's oh, so okay. You know, like lots of difficult times people have and others yeah. just don't know what to say or do. So they don't say anything like, yeah. like, la, 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 I don't hear you. And then that person feels even more isolated and alone. And that's a problem I wanted to stop. And I believe people don't reach out to others, not because they don't care, but because they actually just don't feel they are equipped, you know, like hmm. they don't know what to okay. say, they don't know what to do. So this book helps with that problem. That's awesome. So um, I know it's, um, the time is uh, 4.40. Okay. Um, no, it's, it's not 440 yet, but it's getting close. And uh, actually, I have another interviewer at 445, so okay. at least room for another question. Sure. Um, so um, um, I don't know if the audience wants to uh, ask a question for Kelsey. Um, And Kelsey not. and Leia, um, I'm yeah. Hi. Quas supervisor. Um, I'm actually interested if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, like writing and publishing your book, like kind of that process and how you got into that. Sure. Um, well, again, I thought it would be easy to publish a book and that I could still have my government job <laughs> um, and wound up realizing that uh, it wasn't so easy. I had to pile all this research and I wasn't super talented at it. So I had a friend and also a writer help me do that. And then I needed more social media presence, which I didn't have. And I partnered with an illustrator that has a lot of social media presence. And it, the book came at a really interesting time. We were able to sell it and it was sold at auction, which means that a lot of publishers are bidding, competing with each other to buy it, which is an unusual um, state to be in. And if you want to write in the self-improvement space, which this book sort of is, it's, sort, it's a kind of like communications manual. Um, the most important thing is that you start generating a following with social media, like, uh, and having a point of view, having a point of view about what, whether it's time management or relationships or, gosh, you know, being queer in rural America and what that means, having a, um, a real point of view that you confidently put across with social media is a way of establishing a platform. However, there are people out there in social media who are really talented at it, and I'm not. So that, you know, it's, it's you know, people in publishing will say, just get a social media platform. And that's, you know, like telling somebody, you know, just go to Harvard and study metaphysics, you know, like it's just not <laughs> that easy for everyone um, and not that easily done. So, uh, but that's what you're, that's what you're supposed to do. I, I did a very unconventional path and um, I was asked to do another book um, on empathy and I actually am not sure I'm going to do it because it doesn't pay very much. And you really have to have a economic means for, for publishing in that field. And then also some other objective that the publicity of the book will serve you financially, if, if you need to make a living. If you're uh, employed, like at a university or for a company that will support this work um, as well, then that's really lucky. That's Thank you. Right. That's, yeah, I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very helpful. Thank 